That was a really nice introduction, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name's Justin Hart, and I'm a roboticist. And what I do is I build robots in order to understand how people think and how they interact with each other. And I try to model these processes so we can build robots which are able to do things that people do very well, but computers and robots currently do very poorly. And what I'm best known for is my research in the development of early forms of self-awareness, which were the basis of my doctoral thesis. And what I mean by that is a very specific, specific thing. I was very concrete when I picked this topic for my thesis because it is sort of um, an elephant in the room topic for artificial intelligence. A lot of people think of self-awareness as sort of an end game for artificial intelligence. And uh, research doesn't really work that way. Research works like you take baby steps and you start to investigate something, you start to understand it. So when we picked this topic, we went to the developmental psychology literature and picked something we could be really, really concrete about. And the thing that we were really concrete about is the way that people learn about their bodies and senses through the experience of using them together with each other. And this is very, very different from how we do this in robots. I'm gonna go into that in a few minutes. My research, top, uh, my research touches on areas of artificial intelligence, computer vision, human-robot interaction, and an area that's sort of starting to grow called cognitive developmental robotics. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll have an idea of what drives me and motivates me and what all these words mean and what all this is. Um, here are a few of the robots that I've worked with. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is the robot that I worked with during my PhD. This is a robot called Nico. Nico is an upper torso humanoid robot, so it's modeled to look like a person. And it's modeled to look like a person at the 50th percentile at 18 months old. And the reason that that age was picked was because the research group that I was working with, the research group that developed that robot, the Social Robotics Lab at, Uni at Yale University, um, wanted to study both infant social and motor skill development. <laughs> And they also want to study this as it develops in toddlerhood. And so this was sort of a fair compromise. When you build robots, you, you don't tend to build tons of them. They're expensive, they're difficult, they take large teams of people to develop. Uh, we'll go back into that in a few minutes. Um, the one in the upper right-hand corner uh, actually sits on the desk to the left of me at work. The person sitting across from it is my colleague, Shara Sheikh Lashlami. And she and I have been working very closely together lately on handovers. But what she's doing in that picture actually is uh, working on an experiment that I have to do with uh, collaboration and timing, how people match each other's work pace. And the robot that she's interacting with is called the Barrett Whole Arm Manipulator. It's a robotic arm. It's a very full-featured robotic arm. It has features like back drive where you can push on it and it'll move back. We can measure forces that you're pushing on it. Uh, we can safely interact with it in a close range. It has this dexterous manipulator on the end, that little hand. Uh, it's really quite a robot. In the lower left-hand corner, you see another robotic arm. The orange part is called a KUKA lightweight robot and it's a really great robotic arm. Uh, it's sitting on a mobile gantry platform, which is sort of like an overhead crane. And this is part of a system we've developed called the Robot Assistant. And the robot assistant's a research platform for studying what's called collaborative manufacturing. So this is a person and a robot working alongside each other to assemble something in a factory scenario. And the person who's sort of working on the car door, I know that's a little bit hard to see, but that's a car door. That's my colleague, Matthew Pan. And this is at Université Laval in Quebec City. And uh, what he's doing is he is doing part of the assembly task for a car door and the lightweight robot is moving back and forth and handing them parts to insert onto the door. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner is another really great research platform. Uh, this is called the Willow Garage Personal Robot 2, or PR2. And this is really one of the most complete research robots that's ever been built. Uh, it's covered in sensors. Uh, it's got cameras in the arms so that you can locate things that you're trying to grasp. It's got stereo vision in its head. 
Uh, on top of that, it has the Microsoft Connect, and in, embedded in the head is an older structured light sensor. These are ways of seeing in 3D. Um, it has laser radar to help it navigate and see other things in 3D. Two fairly good dexterous arms, good grippers. Um, it's one of the best research robots ever built. And one of the things that all these robots have in common is that they're research devices. Uh, it's not like when you buy a Roomba and someone says, what does your robot do? And it vacuums your floor. You know, this, <laughs> these things, uh, they're, they're really intended to provide an experimenter with the variety of tools that they need in order to carry out their experiments. And normally, you fire it up, it doesn't do anything. The guy who is you know, doing the experiment fires up their experiment, it does that one experiment, and then it kind of stops. And the reason for that is because we're trying to study something. You know? um, the, the one in the lower left-hand corner does actually do quite a few things because it's designed both as an experimental platform and as a platform to demonstrate the technologies that we're developing. But in general, these are set up for experiments. So a little bit more about Nico. Nico is the robot that I worked with the most so far in my career. Uh, it's got a stereo vision system, which I used extensively in my thesis. So if you look at the eyes, there are cameras embedded in the eyes. And it's got one arm, which is the classical arm. That's the black arm that was developed by the uh, original group. A stronger arm that we added later, that's the silver one. Um, and basically, it's a platform for studying um, the development of infant and childhood social skills and motor skills. And you can see it's looking in a mirror in this picture, and actually that's sort of the iconic thing in my thesis, was that there was an interaction that I had where the robot learns about its body and senses in a way that's inspired by how infants do it. So what it does is it thrashes its arms around in its visual field, and it learns how its arm moves. And it also uses this as a stimulus for its visual system, so it's able to sort of calibrate its eyes. It's able to figure out the focal length of the lens and some optical properties that are necessary in order to see in 3D. And what's really interesting about this is that people have this ability that's very difficult to replicate in robots. And that is that if I close my eyes and I put my hand out in front of my face, I know where it's gonna be when I open up my eyes. And this is partly because you learned about your body and your senses by using them together. They're calibrated to each other and everything's sort of rooted through this central perceptual system that gives you the ability to understand and interpret input by combining these inputs. And that's remarkably difficult for robots, um, but my thesis was about solving that problem in the way that is inspired by the way that people do it. And then what we did is we wanted to show that this self-model was capable of doing a novel task, something that we really couldn't accomplish with another robot. And so what the robot does is it waves its arm around and looks at its reflection in the mirror and then infers the perspective of the mirror so it can tell where objects are reflected in the mirror and make predictions about that and do stereo vision looking into the mirror. So this is the way that this is classically done. This is the way that robots are classically calibrated. Um, on the left hand side you see camera calibration and I'm holding up what's called a chessboard calibration target. And a calibration target is an object that we know its shape and we know roughly its dimensions. And you kind of wave it around in front of the robot. It takes several pictures of it. And then because you know what the target looks like, you can mathematically characterize that. And then you can compare that model to the picture that you took and learn all about the camera that took the picture. And by doing that, we learn the information about the camera that we need in order to perform stereo vision. On the right hand side is a model of a single rotating joint that might show up in a robot's arm. And the way that we usually work out what are called the forward and inverse kinematic models, which describe how the robot moves, the forward kinematic model says, if I turn the joints in my arm, this is where my hand's gonna end up. And the inverse kinematic model is how you plan your motion. Say, I wanna reach out to this point. And the way we usually derive those models is from engineering drawings. And the camera calibration method is fine if you want to perform stereo vision. The kinematic calibration method is fine if you want to do motion planning. But if you want to use these two systems together, you run into a problem. And the problem is that they've been calibrated to external targets and external metrics. They're not calibrated to each other. And they can disagree with each other. And they can disagree with each other in terms of position, orientation, and scale. So they could be offset from each other. They might be rotated differently from each other. And an inch in one may be different from an inch in the other. 
uh, because they've been calibrated separately. You really don't know anything about these sensors. These sensors are how you're measuring things in the world. And if they're miscalibrated or they're not calibrated to what you're trying to do, you have a problem. In stereo vision, you may also experience what's called reconstruction error. And what this is, is pretty simple to understand. If you took a picture of a cube and you took a picture of a trapezoidal prism, you would have a difficult time distinguishing the two from each other just by looking at the picture. And a robot stereo vision system actually can have a difficult time figuring out the difference too. But if it's well calibrated, then you'll have less of a problem, you'll have less reconstruction errors, and you'll be able to see better in 3D. So to briefly explain how this works, uh, all of Nico's joints are revolute joints, they rotate. And so what Nico first does is it moves one joint at a time tracing a circle in space. And that circle uniquely defines the joint. And what I did is I built a system that's able to take that unique description, the unique description of the other joint in the arm, and the next joint in the arm, the next joint in the arm, and solve a series of equations that then spits out a model of the arm. Now this is an okay model. It's limited by a few factors. The resolution of the camera, the resolution of the robot's encoders, which tell it the positions that its joints are turned to, and the fact that the robot can really only move its arm around in the front of its face, so it can't take that much of a sample of the data that it needs. So we supplement this with a method where the robot then randomly thrashes its arm around. And what it does is it says, I think that my hand's gonna be here. And then it measures it with a stereo vision system and sees that it's actually over here. And so what it's able to do is use a mathematical technique called optimization to then sort of bring those errors down to make them smaller, to find a better model of how the arm moves. And sort of the big insight that I had that was very different from what people were doing before is that if I did this in 2D, if I projected down into the visual field where I thought I would see the hand in 2D instead of in 3D, then I could simultaneously calibrate my camera and my arm. So what I'm doing is, is I'm using the robot's body as its calibration target, rather than an external calibration target and rather than a drawing. And so what it does is it trades off the errors between what its stereo vision system sees and what its kinematic models are predicting and makes those smaller. And we actually arrive at a much better calibration than has been achieved before. And while that sort of, well, people have come up with better calibrations, let's get real. But this is a very, very good calibration, especially for the fact that the robot's kind of able to do it autonomously. Uh, this is competitive with any technique that's out there. Uh, it may actually be better than um, probably any other technique on a robot. In fact, I don't want to necessarily say that because I'm, I'm good friends with the guy who developed the competing technique. Both of our techniques are very good. <laughs> um, but, um, what really intrigues me about this and what really inspires me about this is that this is directly based on ideas about how people learn about their bodies and senses through experience. This is a direct model of doing that. And it may not match biology. We don't know enough about the brain yet to, to map this. And the way the robot solves is by solving a linear system of equations. Your brain certainly is probably not doing that. Um, but it is behaviorally inspired by the way that people do it. Uh, so I'm interested in this problem of self-awareness and the de facto sort of canonical test of whether or not an animal or any creature is self-aware is this test called the mirror test. And this was developed by Gordon Gallup in 1970. And basically it's a test of whether or not an animal is self-aware. And the idea here is that uh, a mirror is introduced into the animal's enclosure the animal will at first socially behave towards the mirror. When that stops, they mark the animal on the head with a non-tactile odorless dye so the animal can't observe it without looking in the mirror. And with the animal, when the animal sees a mirror, if they poke the mirror, they know the animal doesn't know what the heck's going on. If they poke themselves, they know that the animal both recognizes that they don't look the way they did before and recognizes that it's a change to them, not to some animal in the mirror. So there's a lot of interest in this test because people are interested in working on self-aware robots and artificially intelligent systems. There's another test of self-awareness which is a little bit less known, but I think equally important. And I should explain what's going on in this photo because it's hard to see. Um, but this is the test of using mirrors as instruments for spatial reasoning. And what you see is this is a pygmy marmoset 
and it comes from one of my favorite Mark test papers, actually. Uh, the marmoset is sitting on a shelf that is just sort of, there's a gap between the shelf and the enclosure that the marmoset's sitting in. And there's a mirror on the opposite wall of the enclosure. And there is a food pellet under the shelf. So if the marmoset is able to understand the reflection in the mirror, then it's gonna see the food pellet and reach for it under the shelf using the mirror for spatial reasoning because it has a high motivation to get this food pellet. And if it doesn't, then it's not getting the food pellet. And marmosets can do this. This is a form of spatial reasoning. However, they can't pass the mirror test, the mark test. And this is my favorite, favorite picture of an animal failing the mark test. <laughs> so let me explain this because this is great, okay? Uh, they had a chocolate flavored foam that they introduced the marmosets to and then they sprayed it on their forehead. So there's a little dot of chocolate cream on the marmoset's forehead. <laughs> and it doesn't know that there isn't another marmoset in there with chocolate cream on its forehead. So it is licking the other marmoset to try to get it off. Uh, and while this is funny, um, it, it illustrates something that's important, which is that uh, the spatial reasoning aspect of mirror reasoning is a task that some animals can pass, whereas they can't pass the mark test. It it's, may be simpler, and it may be a precursor to that behavior. It also shows up in human infants before they're able to pass the mark test. So here's our version of a robot performing spatial reasoning using its self model, what it's learned about itself. So this is Nico again, and what Nico is doing is uh, the robot's looking into the mirror. It knows that its physical hand is where the green dot is, but it sees the reflection where the blue dot is. And using a variant of the algorithm that allowed it to learn about its body and its senses through experience, it's now also able to infer the visual perspective of the mirror. And so this was a really big result for me. <laughs> this was great. Uh, this immediately caught media attention all over the world. Uh, I got an award for my dissertation work from the SME for this. Uh, this was featured in New Scientist. Uh, the next day, or maybe two days later, it was on the BBC, NBC. Um, it was a pretty incredible time to be me. I was giving lots of uh, talks, and just things were great. And like any PhD student would at this juncture, I started looking for a job. Because when you have a big scientific <laughs> result like that, you're like, I gotta, I gotta strike while the iron's hot. You know, every laboratory in the world was calling me up and was like, hey, do you wanna come over? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Are you looking for a professor or a postdoc? Cause I am. And, um, and that's what eventually led me to come to work with Elizabeth Croft and the Collaborative Advanced Robots and Intelligence Systems uh, Laboratory at the University of British Columbia. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of what we do there. Uh, this is a system called the Robot Assistant. It's a platform for collaborative manufacturing research. And basically what goes on is that we want a human and a robot to act as partners, putting together um, devices, cars, airplanes, things like that. Um, I didn't get into this because I'm interested in building cars. And you might have picked that up because I spent seven years working on a baby robot that is definitely not <laughs> strong enough to build a car. Um, but actually, uh, social forms of self-awareness play an important role in communication and coordination of behavior. I have to know that you don't necessarily know everything that I do. Like I might see that you drop something or there's a part that's missing. Uh, we want to do things like match our work pace or divide up the labor properly, things like that. So I have to plan knowing some things that you may not know and knowing that I need to communicate with you. And this provides a basis and a really cool task, a really cool series of tasks for the structured uh, study of these social phenomena, which are extensions of the forms of self-awareness that I was interested in during my do uh, doctoral research. Uh, one thing that you might have seen in the video is that the robot has this really elegant handover that it does. And that handover controller was developed by my colleague Wesley Chan during his master's work at UBC. And uh, this is not the handover controller. This is not super elegant. Uh, 
this is sort of treating handovers like a switch. And what it does is the robot has sort of a death grip on this object. And when Wesley pulls it enough for the arm to be displaced by a certain distance, the robot will let go. And this is classically how robot handovers work. And Wesley had an insight where he studied how handovers work. And he studied how people hand objects over to each other. And this is a much more human-like handover that happens. The robot knows that it only needs to exert enough effort to hold on to the object to actually keep it stable and not drop it. So when it feels that it no longer is sort of managing the weight of the object, it lets go and the person grabs it. So um, I've been working on doing this in reverse uh, with Sarah Sheikh Laslani, uh, Matthew Pan, Wesley Chan, and Elizabeth Croft. And what we're trying to do is hand objects to the robot in a very sort of human-like way. Have the robot respond to the person presenting the object. And this is really hard because you have to know some things like that the person intends to hand you an object, where they intend to hand you an object, when they intend to hand you the object. Uh, this is an early version of our prediction software for this. We're trying to classify, which is say, yes, this is happening, or sort of mark instances of when people are trying to hand something over. And then we're trying to perform this regression task, which tells us where and when. And so this software here is actually just playing back um, a recording of two people handing an object to each other. The person's arm, which is red, is holding the object. And you see that that person reaches out. The other person grasps it. And then they retract their arms. And on the next slide, you see just the person who was on the right in the previous slide with the red arm. And there are two tracks rendered on top of each other. There's a yellow one and a blue one. And uh, if I remember correctly, well, it's a white one and a blue one. It's rendering weird. But the white one is the actual recording. And the blue one is a prediction of the trajectory that the arm will follow in order to produce that handover motion. So we're making good progress, actually, on predicting the timing location of that handover. And Henry doesn't know it yet, but that's what he's working on this summer. So uh, get excited about how this, because it's really hard, and it's going to be all consuming. Uh, <laughs> um, if you saw the promo video for this talk, um, you probably saw this robot. Um, this is supposed to be video, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. OK. Um, but regardless, this project here is not about robots putting screws into holes. This is a small collaborative assembly task that we could assemble in our lab that I could just locate at my desk, because I already had you know, this like, awesome robot arm sitting next to me on my desk. There's a roll of screw holes. And what the robot does is it delivers screws into these holes, and then a person is required to go in and screw them in. And the purpose of this is to study how people coordinate their timing with each other. So the robot can then match the timings and sort of collaborate with you so that you're not waiting for it because it sensed that the screw was in and then you're done and you're waiting. Uh, and not show up super early because it's racing past you and just slamming all the screws into the holes and getting in your way. The idea is that the robot will behave as a partner and understand your behavior and act as a collaborator rather than a tool. So we'll get rid of some of the routines that people use where they have to push a button on what's called a teach pendant or make a gesture to the robot. The robot will interpret what you're doing and respond appropriately. Uh, so what's next? Um, well, I still really want to construct a robot that passes the mirror test. No robot ever has. Um, and uh, I made concrete progress on this project, so uh, a lot of people are really chomping at the bit to either see this working or to do it themselves. Uh, so I would like to do that. Uh, I got into collaborative manufacturing because I'm interested in self-other social reasoning. And that is the direction that we're going with this work at UBC. Um, I'm also doing a lot of behavior and social cue recognition, so the handover sort of thing where we're trying to interpret the cues for handovers. And modeling about reasoning and shared tasks, which is very central to this collaborative manufacturing thing. We both have a role, and we're both trying to figure out where our role is as we perform this task. It's not just a program that's being played back. It's a collaborator. It's not just a tool. It's a device that acts alongside you. So uh, in the research business, no one does anything alone. Uh, so I do owe a lot of people thanks. Uh, so, of course, the Keras Lab at UBC, Elizabeth Croft, my postdoc supervisor, 
Uh, all of this uh, has been supported by General Motors and NSERC. And then, of course, my doctoral advisor, Brian Scassolati, my doctoral committee, Steve Zucker, Aaron Dollar, Chad Jenkins, the Social Robotics Laboratory at Yale, where I did my PhD. And that was funded by Microsoft, AFSOSR, or Air Force Office of Scientific Research, DARPA, uh, NGA, NSF, and the Sloan Foundation. And um, actually, there are a lot of other people who I owe quite a lot of thanks to, the people who gave me my first research assistantships and things like that. Uh, academia is a challenging, challenging field to be in. Um, and you really don't do anything by yourself. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. Okay, how many of you enjoyed that? Yeah? Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you very much, Justin. Okay, so I'm going to start off very quickly and just ask a question of, uh, and this actually is courtesy of Nick Babington who had to run, so I'm glad he was here. But the question was, how human does a robot need to be to, be, to fit within the acceptance level of, of who we are as people? Oh, wow. So, uh, okay. Uh, that's a really complicated question. It's a really yeah, good question. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Long, long, long ago, uh, when we were first playing out my PhD, we thought about discussing that specific question. Uh, are any of you all familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley? Okay, yeah. Of course, everyone from the UBC Robotics Lab <laughs> knows all about this. Okay, so there's this idea of the uncanny valley. Uh, there's an idea that if you're too lifelike, but you're not as lifelike as maybe a person, that you look kind of like a zombie or something like that, and you're scary. And so um, there are people who would argue that maybe you want to, because you can't be perfectly lifelike, just actually move away from that and develop something that looks friendly uh, and looks approachable and does sort of the right things, uh, but uh, is not designed to be lifelike. Or there's, you know, the more extreme version of that, make it super lifelike, you know, try to make it perfectly human. Um, and the answer to that question is a little complicated because it's tied up in design goals and what you're trying to do. Uh, if you have a robot that's rolling around, like there are robots now that will roll around a hotel and bring you room service, um, you know, the requirement on that's probably pretty low. Uh, if it's something like an autonomous vehicle and you're getting into the car and you're entrusting your life to the car, it may not need to be lifelike, but it needs to evoke a sense of trust in you. And so actually in human-robot interaction, what we do a lot of the time is we try to tease apart these fine details rather than address it as sort of a monolithic question. Uh, I've actually done a few studies on that, but um, I'm sure there are other questions, so yeah. we can move on. That, that's, a great, that's a great response. I like that idea of the, the scary car versus room service. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care what you look like, bring me dinner. No, that, that's, that's great. Okay, so who's got a question? Hi, uh, it was a good talk. Um, one of the things that I think we were all kind of um, amazed by was um, how far some of these things haven't come. Like, you know, we, our impression of robots is maybe that they're a lot further along just from the things that we see. Sure. But, um, you know, we were talking about whether you were frustrated by your efforts through your, you know, the col your colleagues in the, you know, human behavioral psychology field. Like, why haven't they, like, you know, figured out more so that we can use it? Uh -huh. And so, the, but so we were, so we were talking about that and we were like, well, uh, we wondered whether or not any of your work is also interesting to them and if you guys are bouncing off each other yeah. in ways that have maybe advanced both of your fields. That's, uh, that's really our question. So uh, during my time at Yale, I had some collaborations with psychologists. Uh, my doctoral advisor, Scazzolotti, uh, is the chair of the cognitive science program, uh, which is sort of computational psychology type stuff, right? Uh, modeling of behavior and things like that. So actually, there's quite a lot of interplay. Um, there's also a lot of non-interplay. Um, sorry, I'm losing my mic here. Um, but um, the answer is complicated. There are a lot of people who work in robotics, and there are a lot of people who work in psychology. Uh, some are completely blissfully unaware of what we do in robotics as psychologists, and there's quite a bit of psychology we're probably not informed of. Um, 
people generally do sort of these general purpose research surveys, literature surveys at the start to figure out if their problem has already been approached and everything that they can learn about it so they can get as far as they can and do something that is actually sort of state of the art and advances people's knowledge. It's challenging. It's, it's challenging because there are communities, for instance, HRI, uh, Human Robot Interaction, the IEEE ICM conference. The program committee for that is actually divided up between psychologists, cognitive scientists, and roboticists. Uh, well, actually, they're all roboticists, but engineers, uh, computer scientists, things like that. Um, so the answer is that as a broad community, the robotics community maybe doesn't always cite psychology, and psychology doesn't always cite robotics. But there is a community that combines all of those efforts together. Excellent. I'm going to go back here and sort of move. I need some exercise, so I'm going to keep going here. Uh, maybe this is kind of piggybacking on that question. For you personally, does working with robots affect how you view people differently or how you interact with people ever? Uh, so so uh, I'll tell you what happens at HRI every year, uh, which is people will study things like proxemics or eye contact. So proxemics is how close people stand together or whatnot. And after the session where they discuss that, people start to microanalyze all their behaviors and then behave very awkwardly for like two hours because they're super conscious of what their eye contact is conveying or something like that. Um, and so that happens. Um, that's, that's actually probably the best example of, of how it impacts our behavior is like lunch on the second day of HRI and people are walking funny and you're like, <laughs> why? <laughs> and you know why, because someone had to talk about like gate matching or something like that and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome, that's, I, that's, I felt the same thing when you were talking about the, the mirror relationship and self-awareness and I thought about, that's a similar test that we have with our friends and will I tell them about the spinach in the teeth? You know, okay. that, that'll mirror an insight into the, the human element of, do we be honest with each other? I don't know where that went. I've got a question <laughs> <That's here>. okay. <laughs> Just two comments. First of all, true intelligence in robots will come when they can spontaneously and in real time rewrite their own software according to the results of their interaction with the environment. How close are you to robots that can do that? And secondly, you haven't looked at any of the ethical consequences of your research. Like, for example, when robots become truly self-aware, I mean, what happens if they refuse to do something for a particular researcher in the lab because last week he made the robot change the kitty litter? <laughs> so, so, so let me address the, the second question first. Um, so uh, a colleague of mine who works in our laboratory at UBC, uh, Ajung Moon, uh, is involved in what's called the Open Roboethics Initiative, ori.org. Uh, you should check it out. Uh, there will be stuff that's super interesting to you on that site. Uh, lots of studies on roboethics. Roboethics is actually a very large and growing field. Got a lot of good friends who, who work in that area. Uh, there's work at UBC. There's work at University of Washington and Peter Kahn's lab. Um, one of my studies that was done in the third year of my PhD uh, has become one of the seminal papers in robot ethics. Maybe I'm not allowed to call my own work seminal, but, <laughs> but like one of the papers in robot ethics, uh, which is um, we had a robot that would play rock, paper, scissors and sometimes cheat, and this became like a <laughs> big thing. Um, and so uh, actually there are lots of robot cheating papers now, which is super exciting to me. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so that addresses the ethics question, and um, can, 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 can you repeat the first question? How this close are we to um, robots rewriting their sure. own software? Um, so th there have been efforts towards robots which, well, so there have been a lot of thoughts on this over, over time. This is an idea that's developed quite a lot. Um, have, have you, uh, well, I don't want to address this just to you, uh, but a, a book that may interest you is Marvin Minsky's Society of Mind, which discusses uh, notions not necessarily of rewriting your own software, uh, 
but rather higher level monitoring processes which can modify the behavior of lower level processes. There's a research community that has a related idea called metacognition and meta-reasoning. Uh, I have a book chapter in a book called uh, Meta Reasoning Thinking by Thinking, uh, which was uh, edited by Michael Cox and Anir Raja. It has all sorts of papers uh, discussing that very idea. Um, there are active efforts towards systems that do things like that. Uh, you could argue that in a sense, the system that I developed does something like that. It's not changing its source code, it is changing the internal models which describe the vision system and the kinematic systems. Uh, there have been some projects that do things that's a little bit more like changing your own source code. Uh, people have done things like writing planners and planning languages and things like that. And that starts to touch on the things that you're talking about. Um, but the answer is, is that there have been a lot of chains of research that go across that basic idea. Um, and they've all kind of led in different directions, but they do sort of fall under this metacognitive umbrella. Excellent. I've got time for one last question. Right. Sorry, I got the hand right over here earlier. Thank you for that intriguing presentation. I had one question, which was, what do you see as the critical factor that is holding you back from the next step in robot self-awareness? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I have an idea of that, but I'm a little concerned to give it away because I'm because uh, <laughs> I haven't published it yet. Um, so, yeah, I really don't want to give that away. <laughs> um, I, I'll say that. Um, wow. Um, it's not like we're going to write the thesis for you. Yeah, but the answer is going on the internet, right? So, uh, uh, so, so, so I won't give away anything that might lead to a publication. Um, but but I, I, I will say that I don't think that anything's really holding us back. Um, the way that we pursue research is in baby steps. We pick the next problem to work on. Um, and the reason I'm in this field is, you know, I, I do want to see this end game of robots that walk around just like people. Uh, but the reason I'm involved in this is because I'm interested in the investigating, uh, in the research process, the investigation. Um, I'm not sure what I would do if there were robots that walked around like people and were just perfectly intelligent because I'd probably wake up that morning and be like, oh man. What do I do today? Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for so long, maybe I'll go to the beach or something else. <laughs> uh, because actually, uh, what I really enjoy about this is the research process. Awesome. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate that.